Hi, everybody. Thanks. I, I want to we'll try to get started so we have as much time as possible with our guest artists. I'm Alan Chase, the chair of the ear training department. This is Fridays with the Ear, as many of you know. We have uh, clinics by faculty usually this time, every week except midterms and finals. Uh, and the first week of the semester, come anytime you want to this room on Fridays at 1 o'clock and find a an ear training clinic. Um, so, but this week we have a very special guest artist, and I thank the performance provision and uh, her for being here. This is Karis Vicentine Liebman. Hi. Uh, she is an alum of Berkeley. She attended Berkeley for her core studies in NYU, studied jazz composition. She's an oboist, English horn player, yeah. improviser, composer, and ear training teacher. And Correct. The, uh, yeah. I'll let you take okay. it from there. That's okay. only a hint. Okay, well, it's. Um, It's really an honor to be back here at Berkeley. Um, 30 years ago, I lived upstairs, and now I'm downstairs. So uh, very nice. I want to thank Matt Marvuglio, who was uh, my teacher at Berkeley, and I've remained close with him over the years. So thank you very much, Matt. I want to thank Alan Chase uh, for inviting me, Roberta, for all your support, always. And, um, and especially, uh, there was a tribute yesterday to Steve Prosser, I don't know how many of you attended or are aware of what went on there, but Steve uh, was the chair of the department at one time and was very uh, cru uh, was crucial, critical what he did in this department and really uh, made the pedagogy what it is today. And I owe an awful lot to Steve Prosser. Uh, today is his birthday, so happy birthday, Steve, and thank you for your support always. Um, so I'm going to refer a lot to his teachings today, but an incredible person, if some of you have had the privilege of studying with him, you were very lucky because we lost someone who was very, very important and we lost him way too soon. But I did have the privilege to be with him. Um, I feel a sense of responsibility to carry on some of those ideas because they really shaped my life. And um, 30 years later, I'm still doing what I do and it, it was all, most of what I've learned here back in 1979. Um, another person I'm going to refer to uh, in the teaching is another man named Harvey Diamond. He lives in um, Cambridge now. Uh, he came out of the Lenny Tristano School of um, Improvisation and Playing. And um, I learned an awful lot from him in 1979. So what you're going to get today is a culmination of my teachings here at Berkeley, which I think were invaluable. And I will say it as I always say it. I think this is the best school in the world use your time wisely. There is so much here. Uh, this will be with you for the rest of your life. And I have been at other schools and I'm very aware of it all over the world. This is a very unique place. You have teachers that really care, that really have put their time in to build this what it is. And there is not another pedagogy or a program like this in the world. And I really, really mean that. So if I didn't come here, uh, my life maybe would have been very different. I did go on to NYU and finish off a jazz composition degree. Uh, that had other things that I learned. And when I lived in Manhattan, I studied with some very heavy people uh, while I was down there, um, Jim McNeely, uh, Joe Lovano, people like that. Uh, but as far as core study and as far as you know, really getting the nuts and bolts, um, this is the place, so you're very fortunate to be here. So what I'm going to talk about today are some of the things that you're doing in the classroom, uh, the core techniques that you're using. I'm aware of them. I've stayed in touch with the school over 30 years. I know exactly what you're doing, and I use that with my students the past 20 years. Uh, but what I've done with it is I've taken it to uh, another level, uh, not to say that they don't do that here, but I'm just saying privately with my students, we would learn all the core stuff that you're learning, and then we would utilize it in a practical way. And because I have a limited time today, I thought today would be a good uh, way to start to talk about utilizing it for improvisation, or I'll even mention for a minute in composition, but that maybe could be another master class up the road. Um, so you're in the classroom. If there's a term that I say that you don't know, ask me, okay? I know that in the classroom you are doing a thing called um, sight recognition, correct? Everybody knows what that is. You're doing a thing called SOLFA or solfege studies on the movable dough system where uh, dough is um, the tonic, 
The tonic is do regardless of the key. If it's in the key of F, F is do. If it's B flat, B flat is do. Movable do system, all right? I know that you're doing conducting in the classroom, right? Okay, so everything I've said so far, we all know what that is. These are not terms that you're unfamiliar with. Okay, now, how do these terms apply in a more practical sense? Because most of you are sitting in the classroom, ripping your hair out, as I was, saying, I hate this, I can't wait till it's over, and the minute May comes, the workbook goes in the garbage can. Don't do that. Put it on the side, because a light bulb may go off years later down the road. I know when I transferred from Berkeley to NYU, that five-month interim, uh, suddenly the light bulb did go on. Everything I was struggling with at Berkeley became very clear. And then I went to NYU and they did fixed dough, which was like, ugh. So I've had fixed dough system. And I can tell you, for me, I have no use for it, but <laughs> I'm not going there. But for me, it didn't work. It wasn't something that I could really work with. Um, movable dough was a great system because as improvisers, as writers, as, you know, composition is really, uh, improvisation is really spontaneous composition. So to think of function, to be able to hear intervals regardless of key, um, to hear where things are going, the solfeges, you, you can't um, replace that for movable dough. Also, also remember, solfege is, um, it creates an image. When you sing a certain pitch, do, re, mi, fa, do, fa, do, re, fa, there's two different sensations that go on. When you sing fa, it's a very open kind of a feeling. When you sing re, it's a much tighter kind of a feeling. And so by doing those solfege studies, you are getting something as a byproduct after the fact, maybe you're not even aware of you're developing a thing called muscular memory based on inner hearing. And muscular memory is that ability for you to see something, hear it, and recreate the sound where you're setting it with your voice. Okay? And if you have a command of where pitches are, when you work on a solo, when you hear something, it'll be very clear on how to attack that note head on. How many of you have been on the bandstand and have been improvising and go to hear something and try to do something with larger intervals and all of a sudden you have stepped in a complete cesspool. It was not what you wanted. So, oh my God, that wasn't the note I was thinking of because you didn't inner hear it right, you didn't set it right and now you're in a mess and you gotta get your way out. Um, when you develop this inner hearing process through the solfege, you know how far to go. When you hear something inside, you can recreate it. And sight recognition also. That's the ability to see on the, on the page and to go through with the, with the syllables to get the command of solfege. But it is also to see interval. And when you see interval on the page, something should go off in your head that gives you an image. And that is a certain space and a certain feeling for with the muscular memory. It all works together. Okay, so now you're in the classroom, you're doing all these exercises, you're going through all this stuff, and you're still saying, okay, I'm doing all this, but, but where is it going to apply? All right, we're going to get to that in a minute. The next thing is, is that you're in the classroom and you have to conduct. Conducting is very important. Why? Because it frames what you're hearing. If you only have a linear sense of what you're hearing, and you're kind of tapping it out or singing along, you're really not feeling where those ideas were placed. So we take a very linear uh, perception of time, rhythm, music, and bring it into a more dimensional sphere, which is your conducting pattern. And a conducting pattern uh, can be just something like a grid, like, as you know, north, south, west, east, okay? One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. I usually tell my students, okay, you got that right? Give me the and of four with a flick of the wrist because everything moves forward. Everything is arsis thesis, right? Everything is up and down, up and down. I don't care if it's classical music, jazz, whatever it is. Whenever you phrase, whenever you lay out a line, you've got to go somewhere with it. So, one, two, three, four, and one, two, three, four, and one. No big deal, just a flick of the wrist. And then if you want to get creative, one, and two, and three, and four, and feel it on the bounce. But you have to frame what you hear, okay? 
So just to cap this off, you've got the site recognition, okay, to understand the interval, to be able to set the interval. You've got SOFA studies to drill those intervals in relation to DO. Remember, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, and all the chromatic steps exist by virtue of DO, okay, by your tonal center. All things resolve to DO. I, I see it as a kingdom. They all serve the king in a different way. Soul has big responsibility and so does T. If Ray shows up, okay. <laughs> all right, so all things resolve to Do. So you've got your soul fedge, okay? Then you have conducting to frame everything you hear. Okay, so you're working on this in the classroom. This is all happening, it's happening on many different levels. Through the conducting, you're developing a sense of time, a sense of placement, a sense of where everything is through the melodic studies and the stuff that's going on in these books, which I know you know, okay? You're developing pitch. You're hearing things. And in the sulfa studies, when you start to open up those lines, do to t, do, t, do, t, do, t, do, t. It's different sensation going up or going down. But as you get more confident, you're starting to open up your melodic line, right? So then that translates in your head when you're playing, you're hearing more. You're not being so close. You're taking that risk because you know where to step. So that all translates into a solo. So now you've got a solo, all right? And I will say something. Some of you in here maybe are not jazz musicians. Some of you may be in rock and you're trying to learn a rock solo. Some of you may be classical musicians. And I've had a couple classical students that were well into their 40s, 50s, that have been playing for years and came to me and said, I got trouble memorizing and I need help with my ears. So I'm not going to sit there and have them sing Freddie Freeloader. It's not going to help them, okay? So what I did was I had them come in with pieces and they were usually pieces that were not your traditional classical, Baroque, chorale types of things that had resolution of cadences and that type of thing. So what happened was I noticed they were playing more modern pieces, but they were not hearing where it was resolving. And because they were not hearing ahead and they weren't inner hearing where they were going, of course they were not able to memorize it because it became a physical dance with the fingers. So what I did with those students, I had them hone in on different lines that they were playing and kind of hear them for the melodies that they were and to have them hear through it, inner hear it, hear through it. Now, for jazz students, which I usually, that's the bulk of my teaching, um, I have a, a student come in and I say, we're going to learn transcription, but we are not going to learn transcription uh, the way most people learn transcription, which is either they go out and they get an Omni book or they get a transcription book and they put it on and they put the metronome on and they start playing along with it and they're, they try to memorize what was there. Or <laughs> they do what we did, get two large coffees, go upstairs, have, you know, put your little Walkman, if anybody knows what a Walkman is with a, with a, with a cassette, and just zzz, put it back, two measures, zzz, put it back, two measures. Oh my God, I got five beats and, four, and a beat of four. Oh my God, how did I do that? Frustrating. After eight bars, you'd be out of there, you'd say, I can't hear, I'm wasted, okay? There is a way to break it down where you don't come in can I let this gentleman in, please? You want to come in? The great Harvey Diamond is standing in the hall. Come on, man. Okay. <laughs> Let's give Harvey a chair. Yes. We have two chairs. People can sit in the front. Hmm? Two. Do you mind if I... No. He's got to be here. So anyway, I'll continue while he comes in. So there has to be a way to break a solo down that is logical, that does not um, overwhelm you. So I'm going to give you a way to break a solo down. And I'm going to, um, oh, I'm sorry. And I'm going to do it in a way that you see the process. This is not a quick process. This is not a trick. This is not something overnight. This is something that really becomes a way of thinking. And once you begin to hear this way, you will never hear the old way again. 
and it will get easier for you because it becomes a system. I always say ear training is 50% of it is how you think about it. The other 50% is doing it. So, okay, you have a solo. My students all start with Freddie the Freeloader, um, the Miles Davis solo on there from the Kind of Blue recording. Classic recording. If you don't have it, you should have it anyway because when the world is over, that will be in the time capsule, correct? <laughs> that is the classic uh, recording. So, what do you do? Well, at this point, we do not use the syllables that we've been using in the classroom. We are abandoning those because this is not the goal, to be codifying things with, with uh, syllables, okay? You are doing that. That's why you are in the classroom here. With this, you have to develop your own language to facilitate recreating those solos, okay? And I'm going to tell you straight out, and you'll probably know it in the first five minutes, I am not a singer. I'm an oboist, English hornist. I am not a singer. You do not have to be a singer for this. It is not about a beautiful voice. It is not about... Uh, in fact, I tell my students, don't even use vibrato. I want to hear the center of your sound. I don't want anything around it. <clears throat> it is just a tool. And as musicians, I feel we should all be self-sufficient. Okay, and one way to be self-sufficient, um, and this could be another class, is this developing of the lowest note that you have and, and using that as your personal reference. If I had time to go into that, I would go into it. Maybe some of you have already done it in the classroom, but that's another issue. But you have to be self-sufficient. Okay, so you're going to put the, you're going to develop your own language. Usually syllables that are not hard, syllables that are not going to counter, take you backwards on the feel. So, for example, boo ba da ba dee boo dee bow. You don't want to sing. Da 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 ba da da. See how that's counter? Bee da ba bee ba bee ba ba. Dee da 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 da. Doesn't help me. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sing Freddie Freeloader solo, and I'm going to conduct because now I am going to take what he's playing this way and move it this way into seeing where did he play what he played. All right? You're going to say, conducting on a jazz solo, that is the squarest thing I ever heard. It is not, because when I do the Wayne Shorter solo, you'll be really glad there's a conducting pattern going on. All right? So this is just for you to hear the language, okay? So whenever you're ready. Oh, one other thing. When you learn a solo, you must know the head. You must know the head for two reasons. When I study with Lee Konitz, who came out of this Lenny Tristano thing, just as what Harvey Diamond taught me, they were all with Lee. Co they were all with Lenny Tristano. With Lee Konitz, when I moved to New York, I mean, he wanted you to know what the words were if there were words. What are you talking about? What are you singing about? When you get to your improvised solo, I mean, what story are you telling? Is the story that the, the words, I, I went out, I left my wife, and I feel terrible? Or is the story like, I went out and left my wife, I feel fantastic? You know? It's like, what story are you telling? You're telling a sad story? You, you, you're telling a good story? So if there are words, check them out. You don't have to memorize them, but get a feel for what it is. But most importantly, you must sing the head. If you don't sing the head, um, you don't know what the solo is about. The other thing too, omni books, reading it off a piece of paper, we're not writing anything down to the very end. Because this is an inner sensation, this is an inner realization of the solo. And by the time you get to write it down, it'll be so in you, you'll have it down in a snap. The other reason for that being, we're going to learn the solo like a block. But it is not a block of ice, because in the end I'm going to show you how you're going to take these things out of the solo. They're really a collage and a catalyst for their own ideas. All right? We're going to get to that. L okay. Listen to the language. People Go ahead. Do you want to use these chairs up here? And yeah, it's fine. There is also a chair here. Here we go. Okay. Okay. So I put the head on, it fades down, and then it comes up to the solo. Be a, be a, be a, be a, be be a, be a, be a. Okay, so I know the head. You'd fade it down start to fade it up 
into the solo that you're going to do. Give yourself a little bit of time to get the conducting pattern. Ba, bo, bo. And look at the language. Ba, be, ba, do, do. Ba, bo, ba, di, a, do. Be, a, ba, do, ba, di, ba. And get the inflection. Ba, be, ba, do, ba, di, ba, da, bo, be, a. Ba, bo, ba, di, a. Move the volume up and down. Bring it down. Take it all the way down. Okay, nothing fancy, just I got to get the idea out. If he squeaks on the note, get it out, however you can get it out, all right? By doing it this way, you are getting into the skin of the person. You are hearing the context with which he said it. It's like listening to a conversation. You sit and read it out of a book or read it off of a piece of paper, you don't even know what the conversation was. You don't even know what set that up to make that happen. So when you're listening to the recording, if you hear Jimmy Cobb hit a rim shot on three, and you hear the way the chord went down on the piano, that is a catalyst for what happened. We have to hear this in context. This is why we sing it first. And we process it. Now, we, we, to save time, I had Alan do something with me. The first thing, I'll get the question at the end. The first thing is, you live with the solo. You sleep with it, you drive with it, you shower with it. When you think you know everything going on, you start to sing with it and get the conducting pattern going so you can frame what you're hearing, all right? Then, when you're comfortable with that, and this is the steps I do with my students, and this is what Harvey Diamond laid out to me, and I, I told you before he walked in here, forever grateful to him because this is really his code and Lenny's code, and it is the code. Um, you sing it and you turn it down and you turn it up and you want to be at the same place feeling wise, pitch wise, everything has to be there rhythmically the same. You do not want to turn it down and it's like, oh yeah, that's me. And then like, oh yeah, man, Miles really swinging. You want it to be seamless. Once that's accomplished and nothing, you have not touched your instrument, you have not written a thing down. This is all internalized. The next step is you put it on which I don't have time for, but you put it on, you turn it down, and you keep singing. That's silent, and at the end, maybe the last four measures, I'll pull it up on my student and see if we're at the same place. Once you have that, then I have them go to their instrument. Now they begin. They start to put it on their instrument. But this time, their hands are not doing the driving. 
This is not a physical exercise where if I miss a note, I blew the whole solo. Or I had a friend, he was so into Dexter Gordon. Oh man, you got to hear what I was working on today. Oh yeah, what did you do? Plays me eight bars to get to that ninth bar. If you had $500 in the bank and you wanted to take out 20 bucks, would you go take out 500 bucks, put 20 in your pocket and put 480 back in the bank? No. Okay? It's the same concept here. You want to be able to get so free with this that there are ideas. They're no longer part of this frozen thing. That's why when people say, oh, I don't want to transcribe, I don't want to sound like him, don't worry about it, you won't. Because once you get to the meat of the solo, which people, they, they stop before they, before they can go. They stop and say, oh, I learned that solo, I'm done, I'm going to go on to the next one now. No, now the work begins. So you do this whole process that I just did singing on your instrument. Now I have the student come in with the instrument, but I put the instrument on the side. I say, I want you to sing me what matters to you from that solo. Go. Ba ba da ba dee boo dee dow. Transpose it. Be ba da ba dee ba be ba. Embellish it. Boo ya da ba dee ba be da. Boo ba 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 boo ba da. Boo ba ya ba dee ba be ba. I just did six things out of two bars. That's where you start to get the life of the solo. Then I say, get a sketchbook. Write down the things that killed you in that solo and write down the variations of those ideas. Because five years from now, you might have to reference that back. You open up the book, you go, oh man, that, that idea killed me. You know what, that'd be great for a shout section in a tune I'm writing. That'd be great idea as a germ cell for a tune I'm writing. That's where I get into composition with students in that way. We go another way with that by kind of, you know, leading with the ear. It's a whole other thing. It's a different discussion. But then I say at the end, then write it all out. Go ahead, write it all out. See what he did harmonically. Go look at the melodic contour. But it really doesn't matter because you got it. It's in you. I'm telling you, one time I was so into this, just transcribing. I was living in Manhattan, walking down to Soho, and two horns went off. Two horns on a street. Boom, boom. All of a sudden, it was like the beginning of a tune I had just learned. It was like so weird. It's like, what's happening to me, you know? Because it was going into that, into that personal bank. Okay, so now, student would do this, put the ideas in a sketchbook. The next time they come in, I say, you know what? And you know, really, truthfully, truthfully, the first solo really should be Lester Young. That is the truth. Okay, I have them starting with this because there's many reasons. I, I just don't have time to discuss it, but I have them starting with this. But Lester Young, you really want to start? Go to Lester Young and go find something. And when you got that down, then you talk about the next solo, which would be like I'd say get changes. Start to hear how a tune goes through form, through changes, you know, traditional functional 2-5-1 harmony. All right? Okay, now what happens when you're dealing with something that's an up-tempo? How long are you going to go like this? Okay, the faster the tempo, the smaller the conducting pattern. You keep this going as much as you can, but then you start to realize it in different ways. On one and three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. It depends. In a solo, you can experience them in different ways. You can put a metronome on, on one and three and play it back too, uh, uh, two and four. Uh, but you got to watch because on very fast tempos, two and four can be very dangerous. It can start to avalanche back and next thing you know, you turn the time around. You got to know. The next one is, um, now this is a cuckoo recording a little bit because they really push the time on here. And some days I feel really in the pocket with it and other days I'm like, oh my God, like it's really on my neck. Uh, but I'm doing this because I want you to see how to handle a tempo that's a little bit quicker. Okay, this is the Chet Baker solo to you'd be so nice to come home to the Jim Hall recording. I don't know where it is. You fade it down, 
you bring it up, give yourself time to get into the solo. You're going to hear how they push the time, though. pattern you'd be completely messed up because it's he doesn't care when he comes in and comes out this is not Charlie Parker you're not going to get a great um, you know uh, rhythmic contour <laughs> Listen to what they're doing in the rhythm section. And switch range. If you have to. Now watch the pattern. Ba-da-ba-dee-ba-da-ba Beep 
Rade, Bade, Rade, Bade, Rade, Bade, 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 Okay, see how important the conducting pattern is for that. Okay, that's a tough solo. That you would do maybe your fifth solo. It's tough. In fact, I heard something rattle over here. I don't know what, somewhere in this room, and it threw me for a split second. It's. That's the other thing too. Don't get too down on yourself with ear training. Some days you feel so in the groove. Other days you feel like you're doing it, but you're not really in it. It's all there. It's all there. It's very sensitive to what is going on. The last thing I'm going to do, and then I'll take questions, is okay. Still, we're still singing. You haven't put put it on your instrument, okay? When you're learning a solo, student comes in and goes, "I know what I'm hearing. I can't sing it." And I'd say, "You know what? Probably most singers couldn't sing it." So in a certain cases, I'll say, "You know what? That is a chromatic pattern, or that's something that the ear understands with pattern." For a split second, yes, you can bring out your instrument because the instrument is tempered, and you can lock it in the pocket and figure out what that idea is, okay? And then they go back to working on it, singing, but at least they heard it. Now, what happens if you got a solo? It kills you. You love the solo, but there are certain things that you're just not hearing. You just, they're ghosting it. You know what it is, what the rhythmic contour is. You got the rhythmic contour, but the pitches are a little bit funny, you know, like it just, it, you, you hear it, but you don't hear it. But if you had it on your instrument, you probably could play it because it's tempered. And once you lock into it and the mind, because you've done all this stuff, knows what a tertial stack is and knows what certain cycle of fifth sounds are and what chromatic patterns are, right away you identify, you get on your horn, oh yeah, I, I hear it. But we're not singers, most of us. And even if we were singers, you can't do this. Some of this stuff is outer space, all right? So what I'm going to do is, this is Wes Montgomery, four on six, the guitar player Wes Montgomery. I want you to see what I do. When I enter a dark hole for a minute, it's not really a dark hole. I hear what he's doing, but maybe I can't recreate it perfectly. So what I do is, I connect the dots. You hear targets in a solo, and you hear the, hear the rhythmic contour of what you're doing. Go with it. The inner hearing is on. You are on. The inner hearing is guiding you. Trust the inner hearing and go with it. This is why this is not a physical exercise where you mess up and I don't know where to go now because I'm supposed to go over here in this dance and then I'm supposed to go over here. No. Take the horn out of your mouth. Sing it. Put the horn back in your mouth. Sing it. It should be coming from you. This is all coming from inside. Okay? So we're going to put this on. Watch how I connect the dots when I run into something that is a little funny. I hang on to that rhythmic contour and it takes me to the next melodic target. This is Wes Montgomery. And this is fast. You're gonna see me switching all kinds of times, two and four, one and three, maybe nothing, okay? This is fast.
Bidamo, Baba do Bapi, Babu Bum, Baba do Babu do Bumadim, Bumada, Bumadim, Bumada, Bumadim, 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 Did you hear how that all got connected? So that's how you go from a very simple solo. This takes a long time to do. This is not overnight, but it gets easier each time. And you break it down. And let me tell you, you have that solo, you will have it forever. You just need a minute with it, and that thing will come back like you can't believe. Okay? So that's how you take this and make it practical and use it in your everyday life. Okay? There is light at the end of the tunnel, your musical life. Just learn that solfege and conduct and, you know, apply it to other things. Maybe in another seminar, if I get one, we can talk about composition, something like that. Okay, so questions, because I know we're on limited time. Yes? Is it essential to sing in the correct octave with the solo you play? Okay, when you do the classroom stuff, I say yes, because there is something going on when you're given an assignment, you're given something on the staff. You're creating that visual of intervals, which is part of that sight recognition thing. So where you see it, and I, it doesn't have to be like, okay, if it's a G on a staff, that's where it has to be on your voice. But it has to be relative. I mean, you've got to pick your, your key, that your octave. But then it has to stay within that because that's a, that is different. You are trying to internalize not only pitch, but also interval, okay? When you do a solo, it's impossible. I'm telling you, on the Wayne Shorter solo, I was like all over the place. I had a, I had a, I, I ended here, then I had to hear an octave above to start the next phrase because if I started it here, I can't go that low. So I'm switching all the time, like on a solo like that, um, where to come in, and that's why you really have to have a command of uh, pitches to do a solo like that because I'm in or hearing it down here but I gotta flip it up there really quickly on the octave so you have to know what an octave sounds like how do you know that because you did this that's what I'm saying yes on a solo like I did you can go well, however you want get the idea out we want the idea out because in the end they're all gonna be split away and they're all gonna be isolated ideas that you can use and embellish and do what you want and they have nothing to do with the solo they now stand on their own you know music is architecture it all has to stand on its own. I say this in composition too. You've got great chords, you've got a great melody, they better stand on their own. I want to hear the chords, I want to hear the melody. If they need each other to be logical, it's not strong enough. Just keep that in mind too when you compose. Make sure your chords and your melody are strong enough on their own. Any other, qu any other questions? Yes? When you sing all the, those solos, do you personally hear the solfege notes in your head? No. This has nothing to do with solfege when you're singing these. If, if I did, I'd be like a genius. No. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, no. But you know what it is? It's that inner sense. It's all the work you've put in before that, that you know when, like, okay, for example, this solo, why this West Montgomery solo? There are chromatic lines in there. There's a lot of chromatic lines. They're half-step lines. They're half-step intervals. There are, in some of the solos, there's like tertial stacks, there's thirds. The minute your, your mind says, oh, it's thirds, 
because you've done all this other stuff, it clicks into gear. Yes, in that way, oh yeah, we're, I'm going through a chromatic passage. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm laying out thirds. Cool. Am I sitting there going, oh, that's like do, mi, sol. Now we switch key. Now it's re, fa, la. No, I'm not thinking that. Are you kidding me? I can't, I'm just thinking to get through this with my life. So, no. Anybody else? Yes. So, I understand about, you know, solos like that, which is, um, okay. Yep. For example, you take some Coltrane, right? Yeah. And he does some crazy reharmonization, like really fast runs. Okay. What? Okay. All right. Now this is a great question. Sometimes things can be taken out of context. If you're working on solos like this and you're feeling that, and the other thing is too, I didn't even talk about this. I'm laying out the melody for you. You're trying to get all your pitches, but you're also internalizing the time that they felt. You're, you're, you're internalizing how that rhythm section is handling the beat too. You're internalizing all this stuff. You are not even aware of it. It's like driving a car. You're not gonna tell me how many turns you made to come to Mass Ave. You can't remember. But it's the same thing when you listen to a solo and you hear that underneath. You got a lot going on. Now, in that case, you know what I would do? I'd say, man, something with the solo is really killing me. I'd take a portion of it. I don't have to give you the whole thing. Take a portion of it and make it into an exercise. Take it out of time and sing the, the melodic contour. Internalize the melodic contour. <coughs> I mean, what's the objective? Are you trying to play that solo at breakneck speed like Train did? Or are you trying to go in there and pull out some ideas that you can utilize? I think in a case like that, go in and pull out. He already played it. It's not important you play it. You know what I mean? So you go in and, and go in and pull out what you want out of that solo. And do it as, do it as a, a melodic line, almost like an atonal exercise if you wanted to, of just intervals. And do a melodic contour and get out of that the essence of what Train did. If you're hearing it and you're hearing the context it was done, you got it, it's in there. Whether you can recreate it, I don't know. There's a lot we hear that we can't recreate, but it comes out in another way. What do you mean by that? Well, like sometimes I compose, right? And I'll be writing something, I go, wow, this is great. I heard this before. Like, where did I hear this? What is this? One time I had a hook that went back up the top and there's this tune that Gary Burton Chick Corea used to do called Crystal Silence. It was like, oh my God, it was one bar, no big deal. But that one bar was in this head and I knew I heard it somewhere else, but I had changed it a little bit. And I traced it back to that. I said, you know what, that sounds like that. So what I'm saying is there could be things that you hear that you can't necessarily sing. Singing a train solo, some of that late stuff, forget about it, okay? But you heard it and it's in there. You know what it is? It's like an experience you have. Something catastrophic happens in your life. You can't even really tell a person what happened, but you felt what happened. You know what I'm saying? You got it. You got the essence of what happened, and that's important. If you can get the essence of train in something that's killing you, you got it. And you don't abandon it and say, I can't deal with it, it's too complicated. No, get out of it. Be creative with, with what you hear. Be creative with what you're learning. You know what I'm saying? There's a lot of information out of there, and it's not all sitting in books. That's the aftermath of what it was. It's like people trying to tell you what happened on 9-11. You had to be there. You can read about it, but you had to be there. Any, any other questions? Yes. First of all, what do you think, like, understanding the <coughs> harmonic kind of changes over the solo you're doing? Is yes, at the end I would say, uh, write out the solo, and then you can analyze what they did. You know, because you're trying to get a, a harmonic sense of what happened. But if you start there, you miss the point. Because the, the whole point is, is to feel that solo. If you can feel it, recreate it, do it, you got it. Now, if you want to take that information and utilize it for something else you're doing or really understand it harmonically, of course, you write it down, you look at the chords, you look at the choices. You, you know what I'm saying? Of course. That's the intellectual part of the solo, and that's important. But that is not the essence of that solo. That does not define that solo. How you perceived it, what you heard, <coughs> what came across, either it came across to you or it didn't, and it, even if it looks good on paper, if it did not come across, it did not come across. That's it. That's the deciding factor. Yes? Uh, I noticed when you were singing and ducting, there were certain beats that, like, when you did it visually, you definitely rushed on. But, like, 
you came in like at the exact time and like you could tell the band rushing those spots too. Is that just from feeling it or, or you know the I just, I have internalized it so much. Oh, especially on that one solo. Yeah. I know when they're going to rush. It's like yeah. twisted. Yeah. I mean, it's <laughs> like really not the way to learn that tune, but you know, yes. How did I know when to come in? I just knew. Now, I don't know if anybody caught it at the end of the Wayne solo. I completely abandon any any way to define the beat because you know he does that throw away ba ba da ba dee ba da ba do da da like that and he just like it's like oh yeah and I got one more thing to say and it's like completely over the time if I sat there and tried to do it I'd really I, I did it so many times that I know what it is but that solo would kill me every time I get the whole solo right and then Wayne did that last thing at the end that I was like oh you know I'm just internalizing it yes uh, you said uh, you were spending some time to Listen to the song like while you're driving, yeah. shower. And do you spend some time to transcribe that song like measure by measure? I did it when I heard it. The, the truth. Okay. When I hear it, it's in there. It's it's silly. You're not even gonna go to your instrument when you write that thing down at the end. Because this is way at the end. You're gonna sit there and go, one, two, ba boo, bow, three, four, one. Ba -be -ba -da -da. You're going to be there like this, and you're going to write it down, and the, you're going to have the measures. You know what I'm saying? You're going to just know what's coming up. It's not like you're going to sit there and write down a couple measures and work on it in measures. No, when you're singing it, yeah, like if a student has a problem, I say, you know what, that second chorus is flaky. Go back and do it in four-bar phrases, and then they'll hear it. They'll sing it, they'll go back, they'll sing it to clean it up. Uh, yeah, that's okay. But if you are still sitting there going two bars, two bars to write it down, something. No, oh, yeah, yeah. You can break it down like that. Sure. Sure, you can do that. And another thing, too, with the mile solo, let me just say, it's deceivingly easy because, and people get screwed up. You have no idea how people are uncomfortable with time. The minute they got to wait three beats, it's like, they're jumping to come in. It makes you stop. It makes you stop and hear what's there. It's like negative space. You ever see those drawings? You've got the white, you've got the black. The black creates one image. The white creates another image. This is music in motion, rest, space. Miles' ideas are not unbelievable on that solo. They're very simple. But it's where he places it and the amount of space that when he comes in, it makes a stronger statement. So the mile solo is good because it forces you to internalize space, number one. Number two, there are many things that can be played on that mile solo. It all works. Okay, and we've got a great vocabulary way beyond what's on the mile solo. But you have to sing what was there. Do not imply what you think was there. So I tell my students, record yourself working on the solo. You'll be surprised what you imply. And try to keep it all straight or you're going to sing the same hook at the end and end up back in the same chorus and you'll never get out of chorus two and now you never make it to chorus six. That's why we have to realize the solo as an entirety. But the goal at the end is, it's only to get through it. But at the end, we're going to chop that thing right up and we're going to pull, I like this idea. I like this idea. I like that idea. Write it in your sketchbook. And then of course, write the solo down at the end. It'll be a piece of cake at the end when you write that solo down. Any other questions? Because I know you guys got to go. People got to come in. Well, thank you for the turnout. This is amazing. And it really is a thrill to be back and to, you know, just lay this on you. And uh, I hope it uh, opened your eyes to a couple of things. Thank you. Thank you. Got it.